Uh, good morning and welcome to the 51st annual Sugar Beet Research Reporting Session. Uh, my name is Mohammed Khan and I wear many hats. One of them is as Extension Sugar Beet Specialist for North Dakota State University and the University of Minnesota. I also serve as Secretary for the Sugar Beet Research and Education Board and my main responsibility is to make sure that our growers are educated with the most recent and most up-to-date growers practices recommendations. And since our growers are the fastest adoption of technology, we ensure that this, these recommendations are applicable to our field situations. I would like to thank all our growers for funding our research. Thank you, thank you very much. I would like to thank the RNE board. The members are here today. Uh, later today, we will, all of us who have, research, uh, who have had research funding, uh, we will be reporting on our research. And for those of us who are CCA holders, you will get your CU credits later on during the day, at least three times. Uh, we will have CU one for the morning session uh, from seven to 10. Then another CU credit will be up at 10 o'clock. And then a final one will be up this afternoon for the afternoon session. Uh, this program here today is a joint venture between North Dakota State University and the University of Minnesota. We have sponsors, the Sugar Beet Research and Education Board of Minnesota and North Dakota. And we would like to thank Sumitomo Cooperation. They have been our sponsors when we are usually on the ground having their refreshments at this time and lunch. They will continue to be our sponsor and they're already thinking about next year when we shall meet again in person. First this morning, I would like to ask Mr. Eric Ordman, who is the chairman of the Irony Board to bid you welcome. Scott, can you make er Eric? Okay, thank you, Eric. Uh, Mr. Eric Ordman has his uh, BA from uh, University of North Dakota, and he has been a member of the board for the past 10 years. He's now the chairman of the board. He's also, his father was also a board member. We were working there together, and now he's continuing the good job of taking care of the business for the sugar beet uh, growers in North Dakota and Minnesota. Mr. Eric Ordman. Thank you, Mohammed. good morning. On behalf of the members of the Sugar Beet Research and Education of Board of Minnesota, North Dakota, I would like to welcome you as you all join us virtually. The sugar beet industry is a very vibrant and economically important industry in this region where over 55% of the sugar beets are produced and results in over $5 billion worth of economic activity. Our producers are strong proponents of research, are very progressive and rapid adapters of technology. We are thankful to our researchers for consistently providing practical, sustainable, and economical solutions to our problems. Thank you for participating today as our researchers give their updates at the 51st Annual Research and Reporting Sessions. I hope you have a productive and educational meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Next, we will have Dr. Gregory Lardy. He's the Vice President for Agricultural Affairs, the Dean for the College of Agriculture, Food Science, and Natural Resources, and the Director for North Dakota Agricultural Experimental Station and NDSU Extension. Dr. Lardy. Thank you, Mohammed. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, this reporting session where you'll learn a lot more about uh, some of the research that's going on uh, across the two states here in the Red River Valley with relation to the sugar beet industry. As Eric mentioned, the, the sugar beet industry is an incredibly important part of the agricultural framework and landscape of this region and contributes uh, vital portions of economic development across this region. Uh, we're proud to be part of that, the North Dakota Agricultural Experiment Station and NDSU Extension uh, in partnership with the University of Minnesota has many different uh, programs that we offer uh, sugar beet growers. Uh, and we're proud to be part of that industry and, and responsive to the needs of the industry. You're gonna learn a lot more today about some of the work that's going on, but uh, everything from Sikospor leaf spot uh, work to herbicide resistant weeds to uh, increases in efficiency that have allowed your industry to continue to thrive uh, in this difficult environment. So we're uh, excited for the work that's being done. We're happy to be partners with you uh, in furthering the mission of 
of uh, your industry and helping you identify and, and find solutions to problems across the region. Um, and we look forward to those continued partnerships with you as we continue to, to work to increase efficiency of production and use technology to uh, further advance the sugar beet industry in this region. So Mohammed, thank you for the opportunity to be with you this morning and uh, give a brief welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Then we have University of Minnesota representative, Dr. Mike Schmidt, who's the Associate Dean for the College of Food, Agricultural and Natural Resources, Natural Research Sciences at University of Minnesota. Dr. Schmidt. Good morning, Mohammed, and good morning, everyone else. Uh, I've also had the privilege of serving on the North Dakota Minnesota Sugar Beet Research and Education Board for the past 20 years. And I think it goes without saying that this year's reporting session is a first. While I think we're all fine with not having to contend with icy roads or blowing snow this year to attend today's session, I, I suspect you share my disappointment in not having the interactions with your colleagues, the speakers, and your friends that just happen to show up here every January. No doubt you will still learn of the data that was collected and the recommendations that our university specialists will be making via a technology platform but those hallway and dining space conversations cannot be duplicated on Zoom. The University of Minnesota, along with North Dakota State University, continues its commitment to you, the sugar beet producers and associated industries. While our operational efficiencies were been challenged this past year, our research did get conducted in a timely manner. I ask for your continued patience this winter as Drs. Kahn, Peters, Secor, Botel, et cetera, share their educational efforts with you um, this winter and into the spring as we get through this challenging time. Thanks for participating in this session today. Have a great day. Thank you, Dr. Schmidt. Thank you all. We have about uh, over 200 people here already. I know. At Southern Minnesota, we have a group of people there in their boardroom. So if you are all by yourself or you're together in a group, uh, that's the way to go. Uh, since this is a, our first virtual meeting, uh, we decided to use this opportunity to have our colleagues from Europe to give us an update as to the sugar beet research and the progress over in Europe. I thought it will also be fair for us to share with us the situation in the US. So we'll start this morning by sharing uh, what's happening in the USA. Okay, so the, what's the situation of sugar beet in the United States? In the US, first of all, uh, cool greetings from North Dakota. Uh, two years ago, we were about uh, minus 24 in February. And this year we are in a warm spell. You never know what kind of a weather you're going to get, but we never complain. This year we're complaining because it's too warm. We are a sugar loving nation. We love our sugar. Each one of us in the United States consume about 68 pounds of sugar per year. In addition to that, we make sure we use our soda or beverages where we use uh, sugar in the form of high sucrose corn syrup, and a little bit of honey and syrups on our pancakes. We can produce all the sugar we need in the United States. We are fortunate to have both sugar beet and sugar cane. Today I'll be focusing more on sugar cane. We produce 85% of the sugar we need, and about 15% is imported from 40 different countries, from Australia, to Mexico, to Brazil, and our largest importer is from our next door neighbor in Mexico. The producers in all these countries from which we import our sugar get the exact same price that our producers in the United States get. We are a very large and diverse country, people-wise as well as geographically. And in the map you can see, I have a, the arrow kind of dividing us into Eastern and Western United States. In the Eastern United States, we are lucky to have enough rainfall. And in the Western areas, they have more heat, less rain, 
so they use irrigation. We have more or less sprinkler irrigation and furrow irrigation. Over the past 10 to 15 years, we're moving away from furrow irrigation to sprinkler irrigation because of the fact that the areas where they have furrow irrigation, they have also been blessed with oil. So they have more income that they're utilizing into the area of agriculture, which is a good sign. Sugar beet in the US, we are able to dry our pulp, especially in the American crystal area and export it to a lucrative market in Japan. We also use the molasses as animal feed or in making alcohol, industrial alcohol. And of course we have uh, sugar that is uh, delivered to commercial markets. One of the commonalities of production in the US more or less is crop rotation. In North Dakota and Minnesota, typical rotation will be soybean, wheat or barley, corn or maize, and soybean. We also have other crops, edible beans, potato, sunflower, and about 30 other crops that we uh, are able to rotate with. This helps us in managing our pests and diseases, and it also helps us uh, with preventing erosion. What typically happens in the year is that in the fall, the land is usually prepared. And early in spring, depending on where you are in the United States, if you're in the Western United States, you may start planting around March. In North Dakota and Minnesota, you're lucky to get into the field in April or May, where you start with a final land preparation. Then you do planting. The average farm size is about 250 hectares. Uh, this is for sugar beet production. The farms will be much larger. Most of our growers in this area have about 2,000 to 3,000 acres, but sugar beet is about on 700 acres or about 200 to 250 hectares. So we plant in April or May. We are 100% glyphosate tolerant sugar beet. So two or three applications of glyphosate in most areas will control our weeds then we are ready to use our fungicides to control leaf spot. One of the unique things in the US is that we can still use aircraft to apply pesticides. And because of our large field size, this is very helpful to us. This is not very common in Europe. Very quickly, we have a very short, uh, short growing season. Uh, we plant in April and May and by July, uh, August, Sometimes the second week of August, we usually start our pre-pile. And from the 1st of October, we'll start our campaign. It's usually 24 hours per day harvest. And when the conditions are favorable, our producers in North Dakota and Minnesota are able to harvest about 17 million tons of beets in about 10 days. And then they will place that into storage, as I indicated earlier, we are blessed with cold weather and we make use of that cold weather. So we can process beets from, we typically process beets from August through June. One year, Mindak went to July just to show us that it, it can be done, but we prefer to be done earlier. So we have enough time to get their factory ready for the next sugar beet crop. Weeds. Weeds have been one of the courses of sugar beet production from the beginning of time or which is about 222 years ago when we first started producing beets in, the, um, in Europe. Because of the fact that sugar beets are short, weeds usually take advantage of them. And in North Dakota and Minnesota, where we have very high uh, seed population, weeds can very easily take over your crop. With advent of Roundup Ready sugar beet or glyphosate tolerant sugar beet starting in 2007, and becoming more or less widespread in 2010, you can see the lower most pictures are pictures of sugar beet fields with about two or three applications of glyphosate. And that has done a really good job for weed control. And if you look at my field, for some reason there are no weeds. I think there is Jim Morn and others in the picture. They usually come early and stay late. And when they leave, they're usually in a very good mood. That's probably because they make sure that we don't have any of the weeds in the field. It's all rounded up ready. 
We have been able to do things that we thought we will never be able to do. We are using strip till and in some areas no till because of the sugar beet technology of using glyphosate. This helps immensely in conserving moisture, in reducing erosion, in kind of conserving our wildlife and still having improved soil fertility. One has to be careful, however, this is a technology that has to be used with care. We have to be following a holistic program in that we have crop rotations and use different modes of herbicides. I showed you a picture earlier of this gentleman, Tyler. He's much taller than I am. And these are weeds, palma amaranth in the Colorado area. So you do not want resistant weeds and weeds like this in your sugar beet fields. One of the biggest issue that all of us have to contend with throughout the world is that when we use pesticides after time, for the most part, we have resistance. The higher the selection pressure, the faster the resistance. For weeds, we know we have over 200 plant species that are resistant to 22 of the 25 known herbicide modes of action. And in our neck of the woods, we have glyphosate resistant water hemp, we have ragweed, we have kochia. So unlike you in Europe that can probably use ALS technology to manage weeds, we cannot use that technology over in the US. What are the problems we have? This little looking fly on the left hand side that looks like a house fly, picture wing fly looks very harmless, but it lays eggs and very quickly those eggs will develop into larvae and the larvae will damage the beets. As you can see in the picture, you have stand loss and heavy pressure will result in uh, reducing your population, your stand and your yield. Dr. Botel will discuss today the methods of uh, managing uh, the root maggot. We've been using a lot of insecticide. He will discuss what we are doing in that particular area. We also have powdery mildew, especially in places like Idaho. We still use sulfur and all we have some newer modes of action. We have resistance issue and we must use sulfur with our triazoles. Our breeders have done a really good job throughout the world of get, giving us better resistant varieties for powdery mildew as well as rhizomania. Now, of course, as you all know, we brought sugar beets from Europe to the US. We brought uh, not only the, the crop, but we also brought the diseases. And one of those, of course, we have rhizomania. I'm just wondering who are the, our visitors who brought those, that particular pathogen. Here again, our breeders have done a really good job with rhizomania resistance. And at this point in time, we very rarely see the symptoms of that, disease, of that particular pathogen or disease in our field. For those of you who have never gone to Idaho, I encourage you to come visit. It's a beautiful place. Uh, however, within the beauty, you have some really damaging uh, disease there. You have beet crawly top virus that is transmitted by the leaf hopper. And it's only because, again, the work of our breeders and the work of our uh, researchers who were able to use neonicotinoids to manage this disease in the Western areas. I you will hear more today what happens when, you, when our producers cannot get to use some of these pesticides. So the top picture on the right hand side shows the symptoms of beef, uh, beet corley top virus. And the picture below shows you plots that has resistant varieties. So we use a combination of resistance and insecticide as seed treatment to manage this disease. We also have lots of rots. We have Rhizoctonia root rot, Aphonomyces root rot, uh, Foma root rot, and we are using here again resistance and fungicides. You will hear more about that today from Dr. Ashok Chanda and his team. And of course, Sarcospor leaf spot. Here we're using fungicides and again, host resistance to manage this disease. We will be discussing more of that today as well. In Southern Minnesota, one of the areas where we have all the fields have rhizomania as well as Sarcospor leaf spot. This picture was taken in 2020 at the end of the, towards the end of the growing season. And you cannot see a single plant with symptoms of rhizomania or any leaf spot symptoms. 
And here again, this is hard work done by you, the researchers and the breeders. Thank you. Thank you very much for making this possible. And as I said earlier, our growers are probably the fastest adopter of technology. They use what we have and they use it well. Because of this, they had a, a really good crop in 2020 and we're looking forward to continue the success in the years to come. Now, I discussed earlier that we are, our breeders were developing resistance to rhizomania and to Sarcospora leaf spot, to rhizoctonia and powdery mildew. However, what happens some of the times is that when we are developing improved varieties, sometimes we lose some genes uh, that were preventing other diseases that were already present in our soil. This is a picture from the Crookston area. The forefront more or less shows a field that was planted with a variety that was susceptible to Fusarium. You can see the damage there. That variety was very resistant to rhizomania, but unfortunately it was not resistant to Fusarium. More recently, we found another disease that has been around and has affected over 200 crops, sclerotinia or white mole, which is common in canola or all seed rape and other crops has now also been found on sugar beets in some areas in uh, entire fields. Usually when it infects the plants, it infects in the entire field, 90 to 100% of the plants. So we have to be careful of this. We have to be cognizant that there are times when we can get unintended consequences that can be detrimental. Now, as I indicated earlier, we are meeting today because of COVID-19. We know that science, and we are, we are all involved with science, it has not always been accepted. There's a story of Galileo Galilei, who was not believed in the early, uh, around 1440s, uh, in the heliocentric system, when he talked about it, that is everything, all the planets and the earth revolved around the sun, nobody believed him. He was right, good thing about it, he was a little bit older in age, so he was not killed. Over time, we have been able to develop transgenic technology. For example, we have glyphosate tolerant sugar beet. It's acceptable in the US, but it's not acceptable in the EU. And please note, it was developed in the EU. Over time, I'm hoping that technology will be accepted especially when they are proven to be effective, safe, useful, practical, and economical. Because of COVID, the world is more or less at a standstill. We're meeting here today virtually. Our researchers, again, have done a phenomenal job. And the researchers are from all over the world. They're not from one particular country. And they were able to develop a vaccine. They developed this vaccine here again using science, using technology, messenger RNA. You can, everybody in the world will like to use this vaccine. We're not getting it fast enough. We're not hearing any serious complaint about this is using science. This is using science in a way that is unacceptable. No, the science has been done. The ethics has been looked at and the vaccine will become available larger scale so that we can all get back to work. I am hoping that the world will be able to look at one way where science will be used for the good of all of us, and we can use that same science to work together in the US, in Europe, and worldwide, so that when we use the science, it will be done in an ethical manner, it will be in an economical, socially, and environmentally acceptable manner not only for sugar beets and sugar, but for world food security because our numbers are increasing. As we speak, we're over 7.6 million people and we all have the envious task of producing food rather cheaply for all our people. Our charge today will be making sure we use science for the good of humanity. Thank you and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Uh, uh, Mohammed. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, uh, I do have one here. Uh, um, I, it's more of a comment than a question uh, from Doc, Tom Peters. Uh, Mohammed, several biotech traits developed using mRNA.
technology are in development. So we'll see what happens, uh, whether they uh, get approval at some point down the road. Yeah, th so. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. As I'm saying, we shall use this opportunity to show that science can be used safely, effectively, and ethically, not only for vaccines, but for more or less improving uh, food production worldwide, as well as human health, as well as animal health, as well as animal production. There is going to be a vast scope for science, at least for the next decade or two. Let's use this opportunity to work together to kind of get uh, to that area. As indicated to you earlier, we will use this opportunity to get our colleagues over from Europe to listen, to participate, and also to present. This morning, we are fortunate to have Professor Annie Katrin Malin. She's the head of the Institute of the Sugar Beet Research at the University of Göttingen, Germany. And she will be telling us today her story about sugar beet research at the IFZ over in Germany. Dr. Malin, whenever you are ready. I'm ready. Thank you very much, Mohamed. And thank you very much for inviting me to your session. It's a um, very exciting opportunity for me to present uh, the research we are doing here in Germany on sugar beet to you. So I will share my screen with you. So Mohamed, you asked me to present our research here at the IFZ in Göttingen, and I have parted my presentation in two parts. And the first part will be a, a quite general overview on the IFZ. And the second part will be focused on research on digital technologies um, in sugar beet cultivation. So um, the Institute of Sugar Beet Research is located in the city of Göttingen and we are an affiliated institute of the University of Göttingen. And our focus at the IFZ is research for sustainable productivity growth and for global competitiveness of sugar beet. And uh, for this purpose, we perform technical and scientific research in different areas. And these areas are agronomy, plant physiology, phytopathology, system analysis, sensors and data analysis. Furthermore, we coordinate national and international research and development trials here at the IFZ. And we perform several third party funded research projects here at the IFZ funded by different funding institutions. A very important aspect of our everyday work is knowledge transfer along different partners. And I will present this to you a little bit more in detail later. And we are involved in education at the University of Göttingen at the Faculty of Agricultural Science along different uh, levels of um, qualification like the bachelor level, the master level and uh, also uh, PhD students. Yeah, this is the structure of the IMZ um, in the current uh, situation. We have our uh, institute, um, head, uh, head of the institute with cooperation and contracts, public relations and organizations. And then we have the scientific departments in our institute. And these scientific departments are the department of coordination um, with Evan Ladewig as the head and the main topic of the Department of uh, Coordination is technical research with national and international coordinated field trials. Here the variety trials and plant protection trials are located um, in the Department of Agronomy with uh, Dr. heinz Josef Koch, who will also present to you later on um, topics like sugar beet and crop rotation, fertilization are, are handled also the reduction of beet damages at harvest, soil structure and tillage. And a very important topic here in Europe and especially also in Germany is mechanical weed control, because as you all know, and as Mohamed already presented, we do not have um, the Roundup technology and glyphosate tolerant technology here in Europe. In a department of physiology with Professor Christa Hoffmann as a head, um, most important topics are yield formation and yield potential technological quality for processing, drought stress in due to extreme weather events is also a very important topic here in Europe. We had two very drought and uh, very hot years uh, in 2020 and 2019. 
And another important topic is storability and uh, evaluation of genetic and genotypic variability as a selection criteria of varieties with um, a, a positive storability um, traits. The Department of Phytopathology um, is, um, has, um, is performed by Professor Dr. Mark Fahrenmann, and here um, all the important plant disease aspects are uh, handled. Um, the Department of Phytopathology develops diagnostic tools, tools bioassays, and uh, plant protection strategies. Very important topics uh, currently here are in Germany and Europe are virus yellowing and uh, leaf diseases like the Cospora, but also new um, challenges like the Syndrome Bas Riches, SBR, are very critical in Germany and research for that is uh, very important. Um, I'm the head of the department sensor and data analysis, and here we do research on position agriculture technologies and digital phenotyping, and I will present this to you in detail later on. In the department system analysis, um, headed by Dr. Nicole Stockfish, the farm survey, the German farm survey on sugar beet cultivation is performed every year. And here, together with the sugar companies and the grower association, Every year, more than 300 farmers are asked to fulfill this farm survey and provide information about growing their sugar beets in practice. In the Department of System Analysis, also the evaluation of the application of plant protection compounds in Germany um, is performed for statistical analysis of um, yeah, chemical plant protection in practice. Yeah, this is our current uh, team. It's not uh, the most recent picture because, you know, in uh, Corona times, it's not possible to meet in such a form. But currently we have um, 63 uh, people. Half of them are scientific staff and half of them are technical staff. Yeah, how we are organized and embedded into the structure of um, um, yeah, of the German uh, and European and international sugar sectors. So the IFZ and the topic of IFZ is scientific uh, research. We um, do an intensive um, exchange to our European partner within the so-called COBRI network. And we are in very close relation. We are the coordination board at the IFZ regarding technical research and the information chain from technical research to the extension and then to the grower goes over the coordination board where the regional working groups and growers association, the sugar industries and others are involved. And by this, the scientific um, benefit from the IFZ goes directly to the sugar beet farmers and growers. We are as well partners of the IRB and an international society for knowledge, knowledge exchange on sugar beet but I also will provide you some information on that later on. Yeah, what is the coordination board here in Germany? I um, mentioned it on the slide before. Here the, uh, we have a cooperation of the regional working units from the uh, growing regions in Germany. We meet two times per year at the IFZ in Göttingen or in a digital way. And we discuss and run technical research projects on a national and international levels. And here, especially the product development regarding varieties, but also product development regarding plant protection compounds is supported by this coordination boards. And we have different studies groups in the coordination boards with topics like variety, plant protection, agronomy, and field trials. And the idea is that the experts uh, on these different topics come together uh, several times per year and discuss and plan and evaluate uh, the trials and the results to provide relevant information to the farmers and to the growers in a very fast and a very efficient way. Yeah, the IRRB, I mentioned it two slides before, it's, uh, it's a nonprofit organization we are associated in and we are active in. And also Mohamed and his several colleagues from the US are active here. And it's also very um, important um, to, um, to work in these kind of nonprofit organizations. 
the head uh, or the seat of the IRB is in Brussels, but the office is here in Göttingen. Currently, the IIRB has 350 members from 24 countries, and the mission of the IRB is knowledge transfer via different congresses, workshops, seminars, and there are different study groups on topics like agricultural engineering or plant diseases and plant protection or communication technologies or storage. And it's, uh, yeah, it's a very, um, very positive tool and very positive platform to live exchange and to get information on recent research on sugar beet um, technologies and sugar beet growing. Yeah, coming to the second part of my presentation, and here I want to present you some insights about our research on digital technologies at the IFZ. And uh, this research is mainly based in uh, third party funded projects, and we have currently uh, two most prominent projects, which is the Finorop project and the Pharma Space project. And here um, we have research and an experimental field site for plant protection and digital technologies in sugar beet. We collaborate here with uh, different partners, other universities and research institutions, but also with startups, with companies. So it's uh, really a platform for research on digital technologies for sugar beet. And important topics here are site-specific weed control and weed detection, mechanical and robotic weed detection, but also the assessment of plant diseases by drone technologies and cameras. And on the next slide, I would like to present the potential of these technologies to you. So we do a lot of research on drones and artificial intelligence for precise and objective high throughput phenotyping. So we develop and use these kind of technologies to monitor our plant during the vegetation period and to assess different kinds of parameters for the plant. And what we can perform already is counting and sizing, for example, on the field, the homogeneity assessment. Oh, I'm sorry, the presentation is messed up. Um, we can perform homogeneity assessment on the field we are already able to um, perform wheat monitoring and to differentiate the crop plant, the sugar beet plant from wheat plants. So we can do a species mapping um, by this. Semantic mapping is possible as well, which is very useful and helpful for variety trials, for example. And a very important topic is the assessment of stress and diseases like the monitoring of Cercospora leaves uh, crop uh, leaf spot and crop stands, and also the assessment of individual objects um, from plant material. So how do we um, do this methodology? Here is an application this scenario on this assessment of disease incidence and disease severity. This is the work from a PhD student, Abel Barito, here at the IFZ. And he performed several tries uh, last year and uh, this year uh, with a drone and a camera set up. Uh, he's using a multispectral camera to monitor the crop stand multi-temporal via the uh, vegetation periods and the first uh, step is to assess the single plant so assess the location of each sugar beet plant in the field to use this information to um, allocate the corspora leaf spots to a single plant in the next step and here he is currently working on a model on an algorithm who uses on one side the rgb information the multispectral information but also 3d information on the um, on the elevation model of uh, the crop stand. And by this, he is able to identify spots and to assess the disease incidence with very high accuracy. The second parameter of uh, relevance he is working on right now is the assessment of disease severity in a non-invasive way. And here he's using machine learning algorithms and he's training the classifier um, to be able to separate healthy leaf tissue from diseased leaf tissue also in an automatic way. And here currently the accuracy depends uh, still a little bit on the disease severity, but the model works quite well. And um, he's able to assess uh, the disease severity with an accuracy of about 90%, depending on the image and the image quality. 
But here, this research is, um, is still going on, and we hope to provide a model with a high accuracy based on the drone images in the future. And what we realize in this uh, research is that um, a very important aspect is really the image quality um, before you can apply your algorithm and your classifier. So it's better to have a high spatial resolution, so a high pixel size um, to assess in a very sensitive way, small Cercospora leaf spots in an early stage. Another application scenario is robotic weeding, where we do um, a lot of research in the Department of Agronomy and also in the Sensors uh, and Data Department. Um, here you see a video of a prototype from a startup called Farming Revolution. And this um, robot is a platform for mechanical hoeing. Um, the robot is also equipped with a camera and the camera takes pictures of the sugar beet crop stand and the rows. And um, with an algorithm, this um, platform um, can, sorry for that, that platform can ass assess the sugar beet plant and can differentiate the sugar beet plant from wheat plants and can perform a very localized um, application of the hoeing technology. Or it is even thinkable in the future that you can apply a herbicide in a very precise uh, way as a spot application. So coming to my third and last application scenario, um, there are also the 3D technologies we are working on. So we use different kinds of um, 3D techniques like laser scanning or stereo cameras to assess the geometry of objects. And here you see two examples on the left side, a digital elevation model of a field topography um, to assess this information and to guide further autonomous driving, for example. And on the right side, you see the volume assessment of a sugar beet clump um, by drone images. And here we had a, a challenge, a 3D challenge this year and compared different uh, 3D technologies for an accurate assessment of the geometry of objects. Yeah, and to transfer all this knowledge and all these aspects, um, I mentioned it already, we are also active in teaching. And um, at the end of my presentation, I would like to present this slide to you about a master module um, we provide at the University of Göttingen, but it is an open module. It's called Agribusiness Sugar Beet. And maybe this is of interest also for you or also for your young scientists and young workers, because um, we have here an open and international course. It's in English as well. And you will get information on in two weeks uh, on sugar beet, everything what is important about sugar beets, about genetics and breeding, and about morphology and physiology, about cultivation and engineering, pests and diseases, also on digital technologies. And so it's, it's really a crash course uh, for agronomists on sugar beet uh, growing and sugar beet cultivation with an international teaching team from the IFZ, from the University of Göttingen, and also from our COPRI partners in Europe. And the participants can be young master students. These are um, also PhD students and young employees from companies. So it's a quite colorful mixture of different people. And we always have um, yeah, international uh, students here. Uh, they are very welcome. So maybe this would be of interest for you as well. Yeah, and with this, I would like to finish my very short presentation about the IFZ and research of the IFZ. I would like to thank you for your attention and questions are welcome. I, I have time for one quick question. Thank you, Professor annie Katrin. Um, using your sensors, can you determine uh, or identify the presence of Sarcospora before symptoms are observed? Yeah, this is a question which uh, always come up. So this is very, very difficult. In the lab on the laboratory scale, we are able to assess very early changes due to disease infestation. But in the, on the field scale, currently, it is not possible. So um, the technology, especially hyperspectral imaging, um, is able to do a, a pre-symptomatic early detection. But uh, the transfer from the lab um, in controlled conditions to the field is still missing for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. On behalf of everybody else, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And um, 
all attendees, if you have questions, feel free to ask them, send the questions in. Uh, Dr. Botel will arrange for you to get those answers from Dr. Um, Professor Mali. Thank you, thank you. Our next speaker will be Professor Mark Stevens, who is the head of science at the BBRO, the British Beat Research Organization in Norwich. Today, he will share with us pests and disease issues and advances of sugar beet in Europe. Professor Mark Stevens, thank you. Uh, Mohamed, uh, many thanks indeed for the kind introduction. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be with you today uh, and to give you a sort of European overview of some of the pest and disease issues and challenges and advances that we're making. I appreciate that I have a relatively short space of time, but I will do my best to, uh, to highlight these. And as you will see uh, as I go through the presentation, many of the issues that we are faced with in Europe are, are very similar to some of the, uh, the issues that uh, uh, are causing the problems that you're having to deal with in North America and beyond. So when you look at the key uh, areas that uh, we are trying to tackle, uh, foliar diseases are key. We've already heard from uh, Mohammed and, uh, and Katrin the importance and consequences of Sacospora, and I'll talk about that, and that's an increasing problem, potentially influenced and driven further, particularly in Europe, by climate change. I, I'm very aware that uh, aphids uh, and virus yellows are not a major problem in North America, probably more so down in California, but here in Europe, uh, following an incredibly mild uh, last winter uh, and the loss of the neonicotinoid C treatments, which I'll come on to in a moment, have caused some unbelievable big challenges for us, particularly in France and the UK, uh, parts of Belgium, the Netherlands and Germany, to name but a few. Uh, we also have challenges with nematodes, whether that's free living cyst uh, and uh, there are root knot nematodes. Again, I'll touch on that later. Uh, rhizomania, uh, that is more of a, a common global challenge that we're having to deal with. Uh, and there will always be those seedling diseases. It was interesting reading your program for today. The, the challenges after nemices, again, sawborne issues are clear challenges. Uh, and if we're not challenged with seedling diseases at the beginning, we also, as Mohammed has already highlighted, the root rots, the rhizoctonias, the violet root rots of this world are there to cause us some challenges at the end of the season, just at harvest and pre-pile or going in direct to the factory as often happens in the, uh, the European context. I, 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 I share some data, this is specifically from the UK, but when it comes to crop protection, clearly we should be very proud of, of what we've achieved collectively. Uh, that's working closely uh, with uh, the, uh, the seed breeders to develop those varieties to rise in nematodes, foliar diseases, ALS technology, whether that's conventional or, or GM approaches that you have in North America. Uh, we have had the tools of the neonicotinoids uh, and fungicides, uh, and it's made a major difference alongside tactical agronomy uh, and novel approaches to limit the buildup uh, of pests and diseases that have meant that growers have really been able to benefit wherever they grow the crop, uh, trying to generate excellent yields uh, and sugar production. But as we go forward, clearly there are many challenges that faces. These may be slightly nuanced and different uh, in different countries, but loss uh, and restrictions of pesticides, particularly more recently in Europe, uh, as I've already highlighted, we lost uh, through a blanket ban uh, the use of the neonicotinoid C treatments in 2018. That was an EU decision. Uh, and these were particularly effective of controlling up to 15 different pests uh, and associated virus diseases when it came to virus yellows. Uh, Clearly, uh, we need a greater integrated pest management or disease management uh, strategy to keep on top of these problems. Uh, and there is much work ongoing uh, throughout, as I said, collaborations with breeders, the ag chem industry, and, and some of the techniques and tools that uh, uh, Anne Katrin has already just demonstrated with sensors and opportunities to monitor crops to give that early advance. 
but what's interesting, uh, the loss of the neonicotinoids in 2018, I'm sure many of you are aware, uh, because of the challenges that we've been faced with, in 2021, there will be 13 countries uh, that have been given emergency uh, authorization for uh, usage in 2021 to try and keep on top of some of these problems, uh, because particularly specifically with regard to virus yellows. Uh, increasing risk of resistance, uh, we see that globally with Sacospa and the challenges with the triazoles, strobulurins, and other products uh, that are available. Uh, and that is clearly uh, focusing the mind. Again, once again, having those abilities to identify, identify the disease early, using the right approaches uh, with the right varieties is really crucial. Uh, and the, the appropriate developing improved biosecurity measures here in, in Europe, uh, we are keeping a close eye on one or two novel issues, things like beet weevils in Austria and parts of Poland and Germany uh, that uh, are causing some quite large problems and plant loss at an early stage. And again, uh, things like bass which, yes, which is not a new disease, but as, thing, as climate changes uh, and local seasonal impacts change, uh, we're having to tackle that and try and think of novel approaches to clearly uh, build and ensure it doesn't cause growers uh, significant yield loss. Uh, and, and there's also big emphasis here in Europe about uh, soil health and improving soil health uh, with appropriate me uh, measures and looking for uh, soil indicators. Uh, about uh, looking for healthy soils and how we can maintain that, particularly as we go into the future. So I thought I would pick on one or two examples to, to show you uh, the challenges. Uh, and I make no apologies, virus yellows is an area of my personal research for about 30 years now. Uh, and clearly, when we had the use in Europe uh, of the, those neonicotinoids, imidacloprid, thymethoxam, or clothionidinin, they did an excellent job of maintaining low levels uh, of virus. Uh, but it is a disease complex of up to three viruses transmitted by Mises persky, the potato uh, aphid, uh, which can cause losses uh, of up to 50%. Now here in the UK specifically, uh, we do have a forecast tool that we deploy each year. It's run by some of my uh, former colleagues when I was based at uh, Walthamstead Research. Uh, and it takes into consideration uh, temperature, growing practice, uh, and available seed treatments. Uh, here in the UK, uh, we have a very maritime climate. Uh, having said that, we did get down to the dizzy heights of minus seven degrees uh, since, uh, Celsius uh, two nights ago. Uh, but uh, compared to North Dakota, we have incredibly mild winters which enables these pests to survive quite easily if we don't get cold nights and frosty conditions. We use the forecast and we will continue to revise this to give indications of threats of, of the risk of virus yellows. And we've been fortunate to have this model which has been revised over the last 50 years to take into consideration the changes in, in tools that growers have. Uh, but the actual chart in front of you shows the potential situations. The dotted line is the forecast at the beginning of March each year, just before growers sow their crop, of the risk of virus yellows and the levels of, of impact it could have. Uh, the solid uh, blue line is the level of virus yellows that could actually be achieved with the best pest management uh, uh, strategies and really since 1995 until 2018 we had the seed treatments and regardless of what may have happened with a series of mild winters uh, actually they were incredibly valuable and growers used in excess of 90 percent of the area to protect their crop hence why we have the current challenges uh, of virus yellows with the lack of those treatments uh, and the catch up that we're playing to try and develop the tools and varieties of the future that can now afford that protection. I also put this slide in, we, we monitor uh, key locations in the UK, 15 locations are across the whole of the UK. These are 12.2 metre suction traps. And what we're finding also with uh, changes in climate, 
the milder the winter, uh, the earlier those aphids fly and the greater the risk to the crop. Uh, the red dot that you can see re reflects what happened in uh, 2020. Uh, and as I said, it caused many problems and actually aphids were flying before the crop had actually emerged. But if you just add one degree to that, you can see what it does. It brings those aphids into the crop at least two to three weeks earlier. And here in Europe, trying to combat that with limited armory as clearly causing us some issues. So we continue to strive to develop those varieties. Unfortunately, it's unlike rhizomania where we have the RZ1 gene, we're relying on many minor genes to be able to do that. Uh, and this is one of the trials that we've done in the UK, but these are replicated across Europe. Uh, again, and Catherine has nicely indicated the role and the importance of the IIRB and the working groups, particularly the pest and disease uh, working group. Uh, and this is one of the trials where we've been working with all the breeders in Europe with their most elite material where we can actually hand inoculate uh, different genetics uh, and trying to identify tolerance and partial resistance to uh, the different yellowing viruses. And what's really encouraging and exciting is there are some really useful uh, varieties that are coming along that ultimately will provide those solutions. So it doesn't matter if it's virus or other diseases, uh, we continue to look for a whole host of different uh, novel uh, insecticides or, or fungicides. Clearly there's a push for greater integrated pest disease management uh, and that collaboration to bring along very much like you have with the USDA in the States, the resistant and tolerant material that goes into elite grower varieties. Uh, mature plant resistance for some of the pests is important. Sugar beet is very good at looking at after itself as it grows and the changes in some of the compounds within sugar beet. And this could be a strategy to, to be deployed into the future. New ways, novel ways of agronomy and how we can probably deflect or push and pull insects away from the crop and then deploy biocontrol strategies. And, and clearly on farm hygiene as a, a early measure a uh, straightforward measure by growers to sort of complement all that is crucial. That's enough about virus as an example. As I said, we too in Europe, just like your good selves uh, in North America, are having to deal with a whole host of foliar uh, diseases. Uh, we rely or tend to rely on the triazoles and strobulins uh, for control, which do on the whole are very good uh, control of things like brown rust and powder mildew. Again, in different countries, we're able to operate different warning systems uh, and modeling strategies. Uh, clearly, Sarcospora, although challenges us all, uh, and, and again, particularly in the UK, uh, you know, Sarcospora 10 years was really not a big problem for us at all. But since uh, the last sort of three or four years, I would say Sarcospora is really ramped up. And the problem of resistance to the triazoles and strobulins is making us really think about the strategies and how we can manage this good agronomy practice linked with future tolerant and partially resistant varieties with new fungicides that hopefully we can get registered to tackle it. They're all very used to those sort of things uh, to deal with that. Uh, and that's why that photograph that Mohammed showed earlier was also really crucial. We also have Ramillaria foma uh, and Stemphilium 2, which was identified in the Netherlands in 2007 uh, and continues to challenge uh, us for controlling it. What, what we try to do is, as I said, work on the varieties. We're fortunate there are some really big differences in some of the varieties. We can undertake uh, inoculated trials to understand that. We look at the relationship between the variety, the fungicide and the disease. Uh, I, I can do that and close monitor it. Again, the sensors and the tools that uh, Anne Catherine nicely described, both nationally and at an IARB level, uh, are improving all the time. And we're getting really quite excited about some of the outputs that to make some practical levels. And also some of the tools and sensors Rather than waiting to see spots on the leaves, uh, a whole host of diagnostics have been developed now that we can be used in samplers to uh, uh, enable us to be one step ahead and understand what's going on. So really quite exciting times uh, across the board. 
We too have things like nematodes. Uh, we rely heavily again on tolerance for Beetsus nematode, but free living nematode and root knot nematodes causes challenges and there's a whole host of work going on over here to do that. And I thought just the, really the last sort of technical slide is uh, the one thing that we're all faced with is rhizomania. I think it's a testament to the breeding by all the companies and the incorporation of RZ1 and RZ2 to tackle that. But just like uh, we're seeing with other viruses uh, across the globe, they have a, the ability to mutate and change. So it's really important that we continue to try and tackle that and limit the impact of changing populations in rhizomania. So my last slide, future challenges. I think these all affect us in different ways. Uh, we need to be uh, thinking about alternative approaches. In Europe, one of the benefit of climate change is we can often sow earlier and leave the crop in the ground for longer, but that has consequences, particularly for pests and diseases. And as we go forward, it's all about management of specific varieties and real-time data to deliver real-time on-farm decisions, decisions to maximize uh, grower yields. So I hope you hope that's a, a, a very whistle-stop tour of some of the challenges. Uh, that were faced in Europe. Uh, some are generic, uh, more specific, but many thanks for your attention. And if you've got a quick question, I'll do my very best to try and answer. So many thanks indeed. Thank you, Mark. Uh, one very quick question as Mr. Cedric Royer is getting his presentation ready. Uh, we've heard over here about stem phyllium and our managers and producers would like you to kind of tell us a little bit more about how many countries it's been affected in Europe and what treatments you have. I know you have some of the triazoles working very well. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience? Thank you. Uh, so uh, it started to uh, to show itself in the Netherlands. So the work of uh, Bram Hans. IRS has clearly been instrumental. In yes, it, exactly. Uh, in the UK, uh, we didn't actually identify until 2013-14. Uh, and actually, so far here in the UK, with my own personal experience, although we see it at very low levels, uh, the strategies uh, and the combination of broad spectrum mixes of fungicides seems to be doing the job. But clearly, varietal tolerance and resistance uh, will be uh, crucial alongside fungicide approaches. It may be worth looking at some of the work that's coming out of the Netherlands for that sort of more specific approach. But as I said, with climate change, uh, these, these are some of the challenges we're faced with. Thanks, Mark. Do you want to just um, stop sharing, please? So then you yes, can have. So I'll do that. Our next speaker this morning, this afternoon, depending on where you're at, will be Mr. Cedric Royer. He is from the Institute Technique de la Better Have. Uh, headquarters is in Paris, in France. And he will share with us weed control of sugar beet in France, strategies, strategy and possibilities for the future. Uh, Mr. Royer. You can start sharing whenever you are ready, sir. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I am Cédric Royer. I work at ITB, uh, the French Institute for Sugar Beet. I am in charge of a plant protection product. Today, my presentation is weed control in sugar beet in France, strategy and possibilities for the future. I have divided my presentation into three main parts, chemical herbicide, mechanical herbicide, and ways for the future. First of all, you can see the situation of weeding in France in 2020. The two first treatments weren't very efficient because the soil was too dry. Lot of problems for emergence of sugar beet. Lot of rain before the third treatment and mechanical weeding was possible at the end of the spring. New challenges, for the first year, no chemical on a strip of three or five meters near human houses. Here, you can see a survey made by ITB each year. 6,000 of fields of sugar beets are recorded. 77% have satisfactory in green. 23% are medium in yellow and 6% 6, 6 in red not satisfactory. The main reason for not satisfactory fields are timing between two treatments is too long, soil too dry, treatment stopped too early, not enough mechanical weeding, big growth of canopodium in summer, and bad choice of product. To summarize, 
position, the positioning treatment, stretch and dosage of product, and mechanical loading. Cost for weight control in France, about 170 euros per hectare for chemical product, about 200 dollars. In 2020, which weight are responsible? Kial Kenopodium is about 50% of not satisfactory fields. It's difficult to destroy a vein when the string is dry. Syrah Sonas, about 20%. Lolmo Alomi, 10%. There are lots of resistant plants. Now you can see some pictures of sugar beet in France. Here you can see fields with too many lumps of water. Here fields with too many comineus. And now field without weeds. It's better. Now you can see the traditional chemical weeding in France. We do a treatment after sowing in pre emergence in about 20% of fields. The different treatments are against Kenopodium mercurialis. There are about four or five treatments. We stop the weeding when the canopy is about 70% of area. The different active substances are penmedifam, etofumesat, metamitron, lenacyl, clomazone, or trifluorsulfuron methyl. In this slide, you can see different means of action. Today, we use different active substances. The red circles are the product used in sugar beet in France. The different means of action enables us to manage the risk of resistance. Here, you can see two tables with the efficacy of different active substances. On the first one, we study the effect of the one active substance of the left on different widths. In the second table, we combined two active substances. In green, the efficacy is good. Orange, the efficacy is medium. And in red, it's not satisfactory. Now, the mechanical weeding. In 2008, the French government passed a law to reduce the use of herbicide in crops. The, this law wasn't successful. In 2018, there is a new project, Ecofito 2. The aim is to decrease herbicide use. This has led us to look for alternative with weeding methods. For ITB, there are two aims reduce the use of herbicide and keep the fields clean. But chemical treatments remain indispensable at the beginning of a crop growth. We have different solutions to reduce herbicide. The first idea is to use a traditional hoe. You can see the picture on this slide. In this graph, we can see the efficiency of the weeding. There are three different strategies. On the left of the bar chart, there are five chemical treatments. It's the standard of the farmer. The result is seven out of 10. It's the pass level. It means that 85% of the weeds are destroyed by the, by the weeding itinerary. In the middle, we can see four chemical treatments and one passage of traditional hoe. The result is eight out of 10. We manage to decrease the number of chemical treatments and the result is good. For the last strategy, on the right side, we can see three chemical treatments and two passages of traditional hoe. The result is not good because there are too many weeds in the world. A traditional hoe cannot work in the world. With a traditional hoe, we can only reduce the use of herbicide by 20%. The goal is to reduce more. We need to use other techniques and other machines. 
there are two ways. We do chemical treatments only on the road. The aim is to treat the road 15 centimeters in width with localized boom or combined chemical and mechanical machine. The second way is different. We work with a mechanical machine when the sugar beets have four leaves. O with restar or rotary O or trefler machine. At the beginning of the crop growth, we do two or three traditional chemical treatments. The aim is to create a difference in vegetation between sugar beet and wheat. Peter Mavnir 7 will be the next show at ITB, the 6th of May in Centre Val de Loire, in France. There will be dynamic demonstration and test with different machines. Here we can see the strategy for ALS sugar beet. The aim is to do two treatments instead of five treatments today. In each treatment, the aim is to mix ALS inhibitor plus, plus traditional product. The first treatment begins when the canopodium has two leaves, and the second treatment is about 14 days later. We must find the right partner for the ALS inhibitor. If ALS increases efficacy, enables us simplification for farmers, reduces TFI treatment frequency index in the number of treatments, prevents resistant problems, but today no vari varieties are homologated in France. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Royer. Thank you very much. Uh, we have time for a few quick questions. Uh, number one, over in the US, we also did a lot of uh, mechanical control. And when we did our mechanical control, because of the fact we have a lot of rhizoctonia in our soil, when we till the soil and the soil went to the crown of the plants, we had lots of rhizoctonia crown rot. Are you absorbing this over in France? And do you know if it's also um, happening in other parts of Europe where they're using more mechanical weed control? I know you don't have as much rhizoc as us here. Mm. Your comments. Um, there are no uh, relation between, uh, uh, in France between weeding, mechanical weeding at uh, over problems. Uh, No, no, no problem uh, with a mechanical weeding and uh, over problems. Hello. Okay. All right. Thank you. I mean, you may need to look for it, especially in those areas where you have a little bit more rhizoc. And my last question, comment. Um, in Europe, you, you're kind of saying you want to use less pesticides, which is a good thing once it can be justified, but you're using more mechanical weed control, where you, whereby you're using more fossil fuel, you're doing more cultivation, so you may probably have more erosion. How do we balance this? The use of pesticides versus the use of more mechanical weed control? Well, to, to, today, today, the priority is to reduce chemical herbicide. Uh, uh, I think uh, erosion, uh, peut perhaps it's uh, another problem. And uh, it will be a problem uh, in the future. Well, thank you very much. I hope with your Conviso system, uh, you can probably use the system to control your weeds and you don't have to use as much mechanical cultivation. And eventually, uh, you can probably have even more intercropping with other crops. Thank you very much, sir. Our final speaker for this session uh, will be Dr. Heinz Joseph Koch. He's from the Agronomy Department at the Institute of Sugar Beet Research, or IFZ, at the University of Göttingen, Germany. Uh, he has agreed to share with you plant and soil challenges and progress. Dr. Koch. Okay, thank you, Mohamed, for 
your uh, kind introduction and uh, generally for inviting me to give this talk. Um, the topics of my talk um, are listed here in this outline. I will mainly cover the topics crop rotation, tillage and cover crops. But before doing so, I will give a short overview on important EU and national regulations uh, impacting uh, crop production, at least several aspects of these. Some have been already tackled uh, regarding uh, pesticide use. Uh, I will end up with uh, some remarks on future um, uh, agronomic challenges in sugar beet cultivation. Uh, what about uh, regulations? Um, there are national regulations which are usually based on EU common agricultural policy rules. And these rules have to be mandatorily uh, fulfilled uh, to get uh, subsidies by the farmers. Um, the first topic is that at least three different main crops uh, have been grown by a farmer on his land each year. And each of these crops has to cover at least 15% of the whole arable farmland. The main target of this rule is to preserve uh, the soil carbon stock. Uh, the second topic is, uh, sorry for this, there's some, some uh, automatic in this. <laughs> I will try to stop this. Uh, the, the next uh, uh, topic I would like to mention is uh, soil protection uh, against wind and water erosion. Uh, um, this is also mandatory, mandatory and for this reason, plowing is banned uh, in some hilly areas and those uh, with the light sandy soils for wind erosion, uh, especially for wide row crops. Uh, another topic is that uh, uh, about 5% or uh, exactly, or more than 5% of the farmland has to be managed uh, um, according uh, as an ecological pri priority or so-called uh, greening area. And uh, this is targeted on counteracting loss of floral and faunistic diversity. This land can be covered by cover crop mixtures. That's important that it has to be a mixture by flower strips or by set aside land and other aspects, other, other measures as well. Uh, such rules are mandatory for farms to get subsidies. Uh, um, other mandatory rules uh, concern fertilizer application, uh, which uh, is restricted to protect groundwater and surface water against nitrate and uh, phosphorus pollution. And for this reason, uh, there, is, uh, uh, there are uh, crop specific rules on the amount, on the timing and on the incorporation of mineral and as well uh, organic uh, uh, fertilizers and manures. Uh, first of all, let me come to uh, the crop rotation aspect, and uh, I have uh, subdivided this topic with, into two parts. The first part is the effect of the cropping interval, that means the time between uh, two times growing sugar beet. The background um, is uh, that this question gained importance due to the increase uh, of the sugar beet acreage uh, some years ago uh, that was caused by uh, a reform of the EU market regulation. Um, unfortunately, we do not have results from field trials on this effect of different cropping intervals under current, condition, uh, current conditions, uh, but we uh, have uh, some data from a farm survey, from a national farm survey, which was conducted on uh, three to 400 farms per year in Germany since 2010. Uh, it is organized by my colleagues, Nicole Stockfish and Crystal Ross. And uh, they found that for comparable soil and climatic conditions, uh, there are no yield differences between the cropping intervals of two, three and four years. Um, <clears throat> okay, I will uh, move forward to uh, the effect of the preceding crop. Uh, we have data on this from uh, a long-term crop rotation trial near Göttingen, where uh, field P was uh, much better concerning the yield of the following uh, uh, sugar beet compared to winter wheat and silage maize. 
um, although, although the optimum end fertilizer dose was uh, up to 60 kilogram end per hectare lower uh, after peas than after uh, wheat and maize. Uh, this regard, results indicates uh, that uh, maize herbicide residues and especially the occurrence of rhizoctonia root and crown rot uh, were the main causes for the yield depression, but not uh, the end limitation. Um, we could use this trial for evaluating uh, agronomic efficiencies uh, for uh, not the whole rotation, but uh, for uh, two year uh, preceding crop sugar beet successions. That means for two uh, successions uh, consisting of a preceding crop that was, that was different and uh, uh, then following, followed by sugar beet. Um, the efficiency uh, is defined in this case as the energy yield per unit of each single ag agronomic input factor, as there are nitrogen, phosphorus, pesticide, energy input, and land. Um, these are the uh, yes, uh, uh, the edges uh, of, of this star. Um, the succession with the greatest efficiency of the respective, respective indicator was set to one. The succession maize plus sugar beet had the highest efficiency uh, for the factors uh, phosphorus, pesticides, energy, and land use. Uh, and only for the nitrogen efficiency, the succession of grain pea and sugar beet was highest. This was clearly due to the very high yield of maize and sugar beet combined uh, in the same uh, uh, rotation, uh, which, which you can see here on, on top. In, in this case, the uh, cover crop, the intermediate crop was also included uh, in the evaluation. That means the energy input to, to grow this crop. Uh, moving forward to uh, the next topic uh, I uh, will deal with, it's uh, soil tillage. Uh, the first study I will show is from a farm survey conducted in the UK, more than 50% of uh, the cropland included in this survey was used uh, under no or minimum tillage practice. Minimum tillage includes a broad variety of tillage machinery uses which leave uh, a variable, variable amount of plant residues on the soil surface. This study refers to all crops grown on the farms included. Another study which was conducted in Germany focuses more specifically on the tillage practices used for sugar beet cultivation. Um, at present, um, close to 80% uh, of the crop is grown with minimum tillage practices, while about 20 years ago, th this was only 20%. Since then, many activities have been conducted to gain and uh, also to spread knowledge and experiences among farmers uh, regarding co soil conservation tillage. Official and uh, private extens extension services have contributed to this progress, including, uh, uh, as one example, the German Society of Conservation uh, Tillage, and also uh, by the activities of the sugar beet growers associations and uh, the sugar companies. Uh, three out of two farmers, uh, which is uh, to be seen here in this table, uh, in the bottom line, three out of uh, two out of three farmers uh, grow uh, cover crops in between the cereal pre-crop and the following sugar beet. And the reminder to achieve the 80% uh, use straw mulch, uh, straw mulch from the preceding cereal straw to cover uh, the soil. Uh, however, <clears throat> I have to uh, say that uh, the soil cover, uh, uh, either by straw or cover crop residues, is usually below 20% only uh, after seedbed preparation uh, done in, uh, in, in spring to establish or to, to put the seeds into the soil. Um, <clears throat> Okay, that's about uh, tillage and now moving forward to cover crops. Um, the survey data and soil tillage have shown that the cover crop uh, is uh, very uh, frequent in use uh, before sugar beet. Uh, 
cover crops species grown in Germany are mostly not frost hard. hard. Uh, they are sown in August after cereal harvest and often produce a dry meter yield between one and three tons per hectare. They should be killed by frost, uh, but this uh, has not been become very secure in the past years. Uh, uh, since uh, 2013, uh, we had no year that guaranteed uh, uh, frost killing of cover crops. Um, uh, and in future, it has to be expected that the winter is becoming more and more wild and frost killing is more and more incomplete. And for this, for this reason, um, glyphosate uh, uh, has become more and more important, uh, which may become a big problem in the future uh, because there is a ban on glyphosate uh, from uh, 23 onward, but will I come back to this a little later. In the cover crop, um, uh, in the past decade, uh, the cover crop acreage has increased uh, from approximately 40% uh, to more than 60%, as you can take from this slide. Uh, um, and uh, at the same time, the proportion of mustard decreased and the proportion of species mixtures increased tremendously. And this is due to uh, the uh, ecological priority uh, introduction by the EU uh, and the national rules. Uh, in the past, uh, mustard and radish were used for BCN control, Beatrice nematode control, but many field trials have shown that the efficiency of control is very variable and mostly low, low compared to growing Beatrice nematode resistant sugar beet varieties. Mixtures came up with the obligation I mentioned before. Uh, generally, it can be said that cover crops are very efficient in reducing uh, nitrate concentration in soil in autumn and thus reducing the risk of soil uh, of, of uh, erosion. Um, the contribution uh, of cover crops to improve uh, the humus stock uh, uh, is very insecure. And only if the dry, dry matter product, production is very high, uh, a reasonable effect can be expected. And uh, finally, I'd have, I have to say that uh, N delivery to sugar beet is not very uh, significant from a broad variety of trials. And there is no clear proof for positive effects of cover crops on uh, sugar beet yield, but uh, yes, uh, uh, Greening, res uh, um, greening subsidies uh, can play an important role in the farmer's de decision to grow uh, cover crops instead of no clear or very low clear positive uh, effects. Uh, I'm now at my last slide um, with a few comments on future challenges. Uh, for political reasons, the EU has decided to ban the use of glyphosate as I mentioned already, uh, the mild winters uh, uh, will uh, cause uh, more and more survival of cover crops and thus alternative methods to, to kill cover crops are required um, and there are a lot of activities uh, to do so. Um, <clears throat> if uh, no appropriate alternative will be developed, uh, we, we have probably uh, face a loss of uh, cover crop acreage uh, and the positive effects that are uh, linked to, to cover crops. Um, sorry. Um, yes, uh, further plant protect protection products will have to face a ban as well. Uh, and this uh, uh, encourages the need uh, for alternative measured methods in weed control, uh, Cedric already mentioned, and uh, also uh, uh, insecticides and fungicides. Um, okay, and finally, uh, I would like to mention that uh, climate change will also uh, impose uh, problems to sugar beet uh, production as for uh, all other crops grown uh, in Europe as well. And uh, it would be nice to have uh, yes, higher adapted or better adapted uh, varieties uh, 
to heat and drought stress. I see only limited potential for improving cultivation methods to, for example, uh, um, decrease drought stress. Okay, that's it. Thank you for listening and I'm open for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Koch. Thank you for your good presentation. Uh, Dr. Koch, I, I have one question. Uh, I was just curious that um, with uh, white mustard being a cover crop, uh, do you, uh, is there, is that, does that uh, serve as a host for the uh, nematode, cyst nematodes? Um, are there concerns about management? No, uh, uh, the uh, white mustard, uh, uh, we, we, all, we, we have tolerant, uh, resistant and susceptible varieties and uh, in combination with uh, sugar beet cultivation, only resistant varieties, B BCN resistant varieties are grown. That's an important criteria. Um, with re regards to your oat cover crop, have you encountered any issues with controlling the oats in your sugar beet crop or before your sugar beet crop? Um, oats are uh, included in mixtures uh, and um, I have not seen any, uh, any, any problem with uh, uh, killing or, or other aspects of, of uh, linked to oats regarding sugar beet. There might be um, a bridge for aphids, aphids uh, uh, transferring uh, viruses uh, to um, uh, winter cereals. Uh, that, that might be a bit of uh, a bigger problem. Uh, cover crops are sown much earlier than winter cereals and uh, they, they might uh, produce a bridge of, uh, uh, to uh, uh, the uh, uh, winter cereals on a neighboring field. All right, can you um, please um, maybe stop sharing screen so Tom can get ready. And I have one last quick question for you. Yeah. You, indicated, you indicated that the uh, cover crop, they do not increase yield, but have you seen any improvement in your crop quality, higher sugar concentration, higher recoverable sucrose? Um, no, not higher sucrose concentration. Um, what we saw, or what we do see sometimes, is a, a, a lower amino M concentration, amino nitrogen concentration, which is used as a quality criterion in, uh, in, in Germany, at least. Uh, but uh, uh, yes, th this, this is an indicator for uh, yes, uh, uh, nitrogen fixation uh, and, and not a higher availability of nitrogen coming from uh, a cover crop. 